Open up to Colossians 3. Colossians 3, we're looking at basic expectations for born-again Christians. Taken from verse number 1, it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, of course that if could accurately be translated since. Since you've been born again, since you've been risen with Christ, verses 1 through 4 tell us that we should be continually focusing on eternity and eternal things. We should be loving the things that Christ loves because we are, in fact, in Christ. So, number one, be focused on eternity, love the things Christ loves, verses 5 through 9. Number two, we should mortify, deprive of power, deaden or subdue our members. What are our members? These things. The part of, the part of me that you can see needs to be mortified so that we don't use them to fulfill the lust of the flesh. When it comes to performing sin with my members, they're dead. When it comes to, to performing that which God would have me to do, my members are alive. Because I'm, I'm dead to sin, but alive unto God. Romans 6 tells us we should act like what we are. We're children of God, not like what we were. Children of wrath, children of, of sin. And this evening we're going to look at a uh, thought that begins in the latter half of verse 9. We looked at this last week a little bit, but we're going to look at halfway through verse 9 because it kind of it's a continuing thought. It says, middle of verse 9, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Now, we've looked at the specifics of things that we are to have put off. If you look at verses 5 through 8, you see some stuff there. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, and so on. We went through all of those last week. Those are the things that we put off. Think, think a jacket or a garment. We put off those things, those, those sinful things, and we are to put on. So since we have put off, that's uh, when it says, when you see there in verse 9, seeing that ye have put off, that could, again, accurately be translated, since you have put off. This putting off is stated as a settled fact or an expected behavior. Hey, since you did this, and, and this, this runs very much in line with the rest of Scripture, this idea, since you've been born again, you've put off the old. That's, that's expected. You're, you're supposed to do that. That's, that's, again, a basic requirement of the Christian life. Put off the old. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All stated as fact. Not, not if any man be in Christ, he might be a new creature. Or he, or he could be a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So that's that's a settled fact. Ephesians 4 verse 22 says, this is speaking to believers that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to, to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So since you, since, verse 1, since you've been risen with Christ, you are to do this. You are to have put off the old. You are to put on the new. Paul tells us <clears throat> what comes after this putting off in verse 10. So verse 9 tells us put off the old, the old man with his deeds, verse 10, and put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We are to embrace the new man. We are to embrace, we are to put on the new man. The, the man, the woman, obviously, the man, the woman that we can be in Christ, the new creature. This is what, what it's talking about in 2 Corinthians 5.17, that we are a new creature. This new man is being, here in verse 10, renewed in knowledge. It's, it's a continual thing. It's new in quality, okay? So I am every day waking up and I am, I am <clears throat> renewed in, in, in the Lord. I am renewed in these things. After the image of God, it says, renewed in knowledge after him 
after the image of him that created him. We just sang a moment ago, morning by morning, new mercies I see. That's the idea. So I wake up, I put off the old, I put on the new. I'm supposed to do that. It's expected of me. And as I do so, I am being renewed after the image of God. I'm being made, made into the image of Jesus Christ. I've, I've given the illustration multiple times about, about the man, the sculptor, who was, who was asked how he, how he got a horse out of that block. He said, well, I just knock away everything that doesn't look like a horse. Okay? I wake up, and God continues the process of knocking away everything that doesn't look like Jesus. So I am being renewed. The, the old is passed away, and I'm being made into the image of Christ. That's what this is talking about. This newness that we're experiencing is a knowledge of God. This, this word, the word knowledge here in verse 10, is the Greek word epigenosis. Okay? Gnosis is knowledge, but this epigenosis has the idea of a deep, thorough, experiential knowledge. Experiential knowledge. I know about skydiving, but I don't have experiential knowledge of skydiving. I could stand up here and I could tell you about it, but if I were to go skydiving, I could give you a better description. I could tell you truly how it is because I've experienced it, okay? A knowledge based in experience. That's what I'm to have of, of Jesus. I'm to have a knowledge of him based in experience. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Experience tells you, hey, I can count on my Heavenly Father to, to care for me, to guide me, to protect me. How, how can you know that God can heal? Well, you say, well, because God's healed me before. God has healed me of, of sicknesses. God has healed me of, of many, many of the, the little things that I've had. I've had broken arms, and, and God healed my arm. It wasn't that I, I went in and it was healed. No, I put a cast on, and, and my, my arm healed itself. But, but who really healed it? Well, God did. It's an experiential knowledge that leads me to, to be more like Christ. Look at verse 11. He says, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, real quick, before we read this all, we're talking about, uh, look at verse, at verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. We're talking about what we possess in Christ. What we have in Christ, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, then, then the, the, the life that we have in Christ overrides all of the social, racial, and economic barriers that would try to divide us. If, if I know Christ, and a person from Ethiopia comes into our church and they know Christ, does it, does it matter that, that they look different than I do? Not even a little bit. No. If somebody comes into the church and, and they're a multi, multi billionaire. I'm not, by the way. Uh, if, if they came into the church, does it, does it matter? If they have Christ and I have Christ, we're, we're one. And it's a wonderful thing. And he goes into, there's, some, there's a little bit of humor here in this passage that we'll, we'll get into. This new life overrides all of these man-made barriers that we put up there. He says there's neither Greek nor Jew. Now, the Greeks, that's a pretty big deal. When he says there were neither Greek nor Jew, th think of back up to 1948, right after the end of World War II, if I were to say there are neither, there are neither Jews nor Germans, that's, that's what this carries, okay? Greeks and Jews, the Greeks had carried out genocide against the Jews. They had slaughtered thousands of them. If you remember, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he was the guy we talked about. He was of Greek descent. He's the man who committed the abomination of desolation in the temple in the, in the period of history that took place between the Testaments 
And then after that, he had gone out and any Jew who spoke Hebrew, any Jew who kept the feasts, he would just kill them out of hand, just, just in barbarous ways, okay? But in Christ, Greeks, Jews, there's, they're together. They're one. There's, there's no difference between a Greek and a Jew. They both have Christ. They're called the Gentiles. Well, I'd say that, but then the next one, he goes, and it's more of a Jew-Gentile thing. He says there's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. So we're talking Jews would be the circumcision, and the uncircumcision would be everybody but Jews, particularly in this day. So very much a distrust. Okay? Jews hated Gentiles. Gentiles didn't think too highly of Jews. Okay? It's, it's interesting how that works, isn't it? How one people group hates another people group, and eventually, even if the other people group didn't have anything against this one to begin with, because of that initial hatred, it just kind of fuels everything, and you got this big mess. So, Greek, nor Jew, circumcision, nor uncircumcision, barbarian. Here's, here's where it's kind of interesting. How many of you remember all the way back to when you were in probably elementary school? You remember the word onomatopoeia that, that got thrown around? This word, barbarian, is the word barbaros, okay? And it is a onomatopoeia in that word. Onomatopoeia is a word that sounds like the sound it makes. So think sizzle. You can say it like sizzle, okay? Like, like bacon or something, okay? This word, barbaros, is a word that would be used to refer to anyone who wasn't a Jew, but it's also a linguistic device, onomatopoeia. It, it would be said this way, barbaros. Okay, if you were trying to, when, when we make fun of somebody, if I were to say to any one of you, and I'm not, I won't do it here because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but if I, but if I were to say, Talk to me like, like a caveman would talk, right? You would dumb down your language and you would use small syllables and you would, you know, me need fire, okay? That's, that's what this is. He says, barbaros is, is using a word to describe the idiocy of the person who is one, okay? A barbarian is somebody who doesn't use or understand big words, okay? Not, not in Christ, not in Christ. This word that would be used as an insult, it's of one who spoke rudely or stammeringly, not in Christ, not in Christ. Then he has this Scythian. That one's kind of odd. We, that, that's, there are several times in Scripture where, where we have this, there's neither male nor female, there's neither bond nor free. But he throws in this Scythian. What is, what is a Scythian? Well, they're a barbarous people who had attacked the Middle East several hundred years before Christ. So at the time of this, when, when Paul was writing to the Colossians, there weren't a whole lot of Scythians around. There would be descendants, but not the same. They were a pretty rough people. They drank the blood of their enemies. They used the skeletons and the flesh of their enemies as tableware. Okay? That's the type of people, the Scythians, they were known for this. They were universally feared and hated. So think, think of the, when, when, a, when a parent, you know, in, in our day, people say, well, the boogeyman will get you. In this day, you'd say, well, the, a Scythian will get you, okay? The Scythians were horrible people, but not in Christ. If somebody, if somebody walks into the Colossian church of Scythian descent, you should put your arm around them if they're in Christ. And if they're not in Christ, you should put your arm around them and try to lead them to Christ. Bond nor free. Slaves and freeborn. Big difference, but not in Christ. All of these people are made equal and can share sweet fellowship in Christ because Christ is all and in all. There are people on the face of the planet who I have nothing in common with except they're a believer. That's it. I don't speak their language. I don't eat. I think their food's nasty. In their defense, they think my food's nasty. Okay? So there are people on the face of the planet. I have nothing in common with them. Their customs I would consider to be barbaric in some cases. But if they're in Christ, we're, we, can, we can have fellowship. We can be one. Do you think that the Jews-Gentile thing, the Gentiles hated the Jews because they claimed to be God's chosen people or the? Like saying, 
who do you think you are? Or... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The Jews, if you think about it, if you read in the book of Acts, even the apostles had a hard time believing that God had allowed Jews in, into the church. Okay, that was kind of hard for Peter to swallow. If you remember in Acts chapter 10, when, uh, when Cornelius called him and he had the, the vision of the, of the sheep being let down with all the animals in it, and, and God told him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten something that's unclean. And God said, hey, you don't call common what I've called clean. Speaking of, you go to the Gentiles and you give the gospel to them because I died for them just like I died for you. But yeah, absolutely. The Jew and Gentile, that would be a big deal. Now, the Colossian church is, is a group of Gentiles. Okay, They, were, they would have been a largely Gentile audience. <laughs> so for, for Paul to write this, and he's got a group of people in the Colossian church, and there's a couple Jews and some Gentiles, and there's some, there's some slaves, and there's some free men, and there's some, there's some, some barbarians. Maybe there, maybe there was somebody of Scythian descent. I don't know. Can you imagine how he felt when this got read? It would, it would be something. But all of, those, all of those labels, they don't matter. They don't matter. I can, I can sit down right next to somebody of any nationality, any economic status, any social status, and I can say, no, we're one in Christ. But again, we, we've mentioned it multiple times. The ground's level at the foot of the cross. The fact that I'm a white American doesn't give me a leg up on the gospel. No, it might mean that I have access to the gospel more freely than others do, but that just puts me in their debt, doesn't it? That just puts me in a position where I need to get the gospel to them because God's blessed me. But love and unity is found between the most unlikely of people because of the redeeming work of Christ. Could a, could a German and a Jew following World War II, could they become friends in, in Christ? They, they can. They did. Multiple instances. If you've ever read The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom, she was one who hid Jews. And after the war, uh, she had been in a concentration camp. After the war, she was giving her testimony, and one of the guards from the concentration camp, camp came to one of her meetings and came up and shook her hand afterward. And, and just he had trusted the Lord as his personal Savior, and he asked for forgiveness. And they, they developed a friendship. Because of? Well, she just, she just was willing to let everything... No, because of Christ. It's all because of Christ, everything that we're talking about here. So, we are to put off the old man, put on the new man, because in, in, when we put on the new man, we're in Christ. There, all of those labels are done away with, but Paul's now going to give us the specifics. Here's, here's how we get specific. We, last week, we got specific about the things to put off. This week, we get specific about the things to put on. Verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. God has chosen to save whoever will come to him by faith. That's what the elect of God means. That's not uh, how some would interpret that or misinterpret that. Those who come to Christ by faith are declared holy and justified or beloved. When it says... Uh, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, believers should put on bowels of mercies. Bowels of mercies. This is, again, a, uh, an ancient way of saying a heart filled with compassion. We're coming up on Valentine's Day. Uh, at Valentine's Day, you see lots of heart-shaped stuff, okay? Aren't you glad that we have ceased to use bowels and mercies as the seat of emotion, okay? That is... Just a, an, an antiquated way of saying a heart filled with compassion. Number two, we're to put on kindness, moral excellence, goodness, gentleness. We're to put on humbleness of mind. This is lowliness or a humble opinion of oneself. Hu humility. Humility, someone said, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less some truth to that, but it also might be thinking less of yourself. The opposite of the Pharisee and the religious leaders of this day, and in our day in, in some cases, humbleness of mind, a, a deep-seated and genuine humility. 
I'm to put off the works of darkness and I'm to put on bowels of mercies. I'm to put on kindness. I'm to put on humility of mind. I'm to put on meekness. <clears throat> meekness is mildness. Gentleness, again, a, a non-imperious attitude. Somebody who doesn't feel their office is theirs by divine right, but rather humble. We, we know from Scripture, the meekest man to ever live was Moses. Moses was many things. To call Moses a weakling would be uh, an error. He obviously wasn't. The Bible says that when Moses died that his natural force had not abated. And he was, he was 120 years old. Okay, So he wasn't a weak man, but he was a meek man. Some have defined meekness as strength under control. So meekness is something that we put on. Long-suffering. Long-suffering is patience. It's endurance. It's steadfastness. That, that willingness to just keep going. That willingness that even though the times get rough, I'm going to continue on. The fact that it's not easy, the fact that I don't feel like doing right today doesn't mean that I'm not going to. I'm going to patiently endure. I'm going to have long suffering. The list goes on in verse 13. Forbearing one another. Forbearing one another means to hold out without retaliation. Think back to our study in Luke. We talked about forgiving seven times 70. Okay? That means it's not the second time somebody, somebody gets on my nerves. I lash out at them. I'm to forbear. I'm to, to hold out. I'm to, this, this pairs well with long-suffering. I'm to, I'm to bear under the, the persecution or the ill will or the ill treatment without lashing out. Forgiving one another if any man have a quarrel against any. To, to pardon to genuinely pardon, okay? Uh, I, I tell my girls when they have a, a fight amongst themselves, I will often tell one of them, go and apologize. And then as they're walking out, I say, stop, stop. I want you to think about it. I want you to genuinely apologize, okay? I'm not looking for the words. I'm looking for the change of attitude. I want you to, I want you to understand what you've done was wrong. You wronged your sister. And I will hear, I'm, I'm sorry for what I did. And then often I will hear the other one say, I forgive you. And, and to genuinely forgive. Which means I'm not, and Andy does something against me and I've got my list of Andy problems. And I write it down and I say, Andy, it's okay, I, I forgive you. And the next time Andy comes to me, he says, I'm sorry. I say, oh really? Well, last time... Is that forgiveness? <laughs> no, that's me keeping that's me keeping record. What would be genuine? Well, <clears throat> I genuinely forgive. We say forgive and forget. Not really possible, is it? To forget. Except <clears throat> I can by a choice of my will say this is gone. This is done. I'm not bringing this up again as far and as best I am able to physically and mentally. I'm going to forget this. It's done. It won't be brought up again by me. That's what this is talking about. Forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any. And then Paul gives us an example of this. He says in the next phrase, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Well, there's a high bar, isn't it? So I'm supposed to forgive just like Christ forgave. Luke 23, 34 tells us that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked down at the men who had just beaten him and nailed him there and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, and that's genuine forgiveness. Jesus didn't stand to gain anything from them by forgiving them, did he? Nope, but he did. That's our standard of forgiveness, okay? And so when we think of how badly we've been wronged, think of how badly Jesus was wronged, and yet he forgave. But most importantly, he kind of puts a capstone on this. <clears throat> Verse 14, and above all these things, <laughs> above all these things that he's just listed, put on charity. 
which is the bond of perfection. The most important of all the wonderful attributes we've just listed is to put on charity. Look, if you, if you only get the one thing, get this one. If you're, if you're only going to put on one, put on this. Put on charity. We'll, we'll expand on that. This charity is the word agape, which we translate very regularly in Scripture as love. Love, not, not love like you have for your favorite food. Sacrificial love. The love that, that a parent has for their child. The love that Jesus had for us. For God so loved the world. That's this word. Just thinking on this, whenever I, when, when you see the word charity, when you start thinking about love, 1 Corinthians 13 comes to mind. See if you, see if you catch the connection here between Colossians 3.14, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection, or perfect, perfect of perfectness. Listen as I read in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Listen to verse 13 and see if you catch the connection between chapter uh, Colossians 3, 14 and this verse. He says, and now by the faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, love. Paul says that love is the bond of perfectness or perfection. Love is the bond of maturity. It's, it's what holds all of this together. All of these things that we've just read about, all of the things that we are to put on, Love is what motivates that. Somebody said, what faith makes possible, love makes easy. And it's true. We are to put on this forgiveness. We're to put on this humility. We're to put on this, this compassion, this kindness, this long-suffering. We're to put all of these things on. But love is to be the motivating factor of those Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 30, he said, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Why, why was Jesus able to encapsulate the law by saying, Love God first, love God most, and love your neighbor as yourself? Why does, why does everything rise and fall on, on those two commandments? Well, if you love God, will you make a statue of something else and worship it? If, if you love God, will you use his name in vain? No. If you love your neighbor, will you steal his wife? If you love your neighbor, will you kill him? No. If you love your neighbor, will you steal his stuff? If you love your neighbor, all of the law, all of this stuff... What we've just looked at here. If, if I love you and I love God the way that I should, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to be long-suffering. I'm going to be meek. Though I may have power, I'm not going to use it to hurt anyone. Why? Because I love God and I love them. He, so, so he kind of does the same thing here. He encapsulates it all by saying, above everything else, put on love. Because... If you're loving properly, you're going to do the other things anyway, <laughs> right? Essentially, 
You get this one and the rest is easy. The rest takes care of itself. If I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I love my neighbor as myself, then, then, then all, of the, all of the little details, all of these things we've just looked at, they just kind of fall into place naturally. Well, I'm going to do what pleases God. Why? Because I love him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what helps my neighbor. Why? Because I love them. Well, why are you doing all of this? Well, because of love. Love is the, the secret ingredient that, that motivates and empowers all of the behaviors listed above. Some of these, as, as we read over verse 12 and verse 13, as we read through those bowels of mercies and kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, even as Christ forgave you. As I read down that list, maybe you have the thought, I I've got some of those. I feel, like, I feel like I'm doing okay. Others of them I struggle with. Well, here, here's the thing. When we see the ones that we struggle with, we need to tune up the last one. Why don't I, why won't I forgive my, my neighbor? Well, because I'm not loving him how I should, and I'm not loving God as I should. This, this relationship right here, my relationship with God, automatically sets right things this way, okay? If I'm loving God how I should and loving my neighbor as myself, these things will very much take care of themselves, so here, as we're looking at basic expectations for born-again Christians, since I've been saved, I need to keep focused on eternity and pleasing our Heavenly Father. That's what I need to do. Number two, I need to mortify my members in relation to their use in sin. I, I'm not allowed to sin with these hands, and the reason why is they're dead. Okay, And they don't belong to me. Okay? That was a, a, a reason I gave. I had a guy offer me a cigarette one time when I was in college, and we had a relationship, so it wasn't just out of the blue. We had a relationship. He knew that I was a believer, and he was offering me a cigarette knowing that I wouldn't take it. Uh, but I said, nope, don't want it. He said, why? I said, because I don't belong to me. Because for me to, for me to use... A body that doesn't belong to me to do something that doesn't, wouldn't please its owner wouldn't be right. Because that's, that's how we need to view ourselves. We need to view ourselves as not belonging to ourselves. So mortify your members in relation to their use and sin. And then what we've seen tonight, put off the old man and his deeds and put on the new man. Above all, love. Maybe you noticed as we were going through these, these verses, verses 12 and 13 especially, maybe you noticed that there's a good bit of overlap between the deeds of the new man in Colossians 3 and the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. There is a fair amount of overlap. The, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of these things are fruit of the Spirit. Why does an apple tree bear apples? Because it's an apple tree. What does an apple tree branch have to do in order to bear apples? It has to be connected to the trunk. What does a Christian have to do to bear the fruit of the Spirit? What does a Christian have to do to manifest these attributes that we've looked at tonight? Well, he has to, according to John 15, abide in him. Because a branch left to itself can't, pr can't produce fruit. But if we abide in him, the Bible says the same bringeth forth much fruit. So these three things so far, keep focused on eternity and eternal things, what, ple what pleases our Heavenly Father, mortify our members in relation to their use in sin, put off the old man and his deeds and put on the new man. Stay connected to Christ above all. Love him, love others, and these, these details take care of themselves.